Good afternoon. I don't know why this hit me so hard, but I really just feel like um, sharing this passage with you and my thoughts um, as I was meditating on this scripture. So today I'm going to be reading from Isaiah chapter 58, starting at verse 1. I'm going to read most of the way through. Cry loud. Do not hold back. Lift up your voice like a trumpet. Declare to my people their transgression, to the house of Jacob their sins. Yet they seek me daily and delight to know my ways, as if they were a nation that did righteousness. I need to read that again. That was verse 2. Yet they seek me daily. That sounds like somebody that's hungry for God. That sounds like somebody that's seeking them with their whole heart and delight to know my ways. That's somebody who, who sounds like they're, they're after his, his will and plan and, and wants to know him better. But then it says, as if they were a nation that did righteousness i want to let that sit for a moment and did not forsake the judgment of god they ask me of righteous judgments they delight to draw near to god they delight to draw near to god they seek out his presence like water in the desert verse three why have we fasted and you see it not. Why have we humbled ourselves and you take no knowledge of it? Behold, in the day of your fast, you seek your own pleasure. The Lord says right here in this next verse, you are fasting for you. You are fasting for a breakthrough. You are fasting for the change that you want to see in your marriage. You are fasting for your children, but you're not fasting for me. And the Lord goes on to explain why he has come to that conclusion. Behold, in the day of your fast, you seek your own pleasure and oppress all your workers. Behold, you fast only to quarrel and to fight and to hit with a wicked fist. Fasting like yours this day will not make your voice to be heard on high. Here the Lord is saying, I will not hear you. I will not hear you. I will not give ear to your cry because you are not fasting for me. You are fasting for your own selfish purposes, but you are not fasting to honor me. You are not fasting because you want to get closer to me. You are not fasting to crucify your flesh. You are not fasting to die to yourself, to live for me. You are not fasting for these reasons. And the Lord knows. The Lord knows. Verse 5. Is such the fast that I choose a day for a person to humble himself? Is it to bow down his head like a reed and to spread sackcloth and ashes under him? Will you call this a fast? And a day acceptable to the Lord. Verse 6, is not this the fast that I choose? Pay attention to the fast that God chooses. I find this interesting because this doesn't sound at all like a lot of the fasts that people talk about when they're looking for something to change. To loose the bonds of wickedness, to undo the straps of the yoke, to let the oppressed go free and to break every yoke. Is it not to share your bread with the hungry, not just to pray for the people who are struggling, but actually reach into your pocket and do something about it, like take them out to lunch or maybe even make them a meal and drop it off at their house? Is it enough that we just say, be warm, 
and fed, I'll pray for you. No, it's not. He says here that the ideal fast is to share your bread with the hungry, to bring the homeless poor into your house. Well, that's a bit of an inconvenience. What if I don't have the space? God didn't say whether you have the space. I don't see that here. It doesn't say bring the homeless poor into your house if you have the space. It doesn't say bring the homeless poor into your house if you have a vacant room. It doesn't say bring the homeless poor into your house if you need a little extra help with your mortgage. It just says and bring the homeless poor into your house when you see the naked to cover him. Cover him and not to hide yourself from your own flesh. Let's read that again. And not to hide yourself from your own flesh. Don't we just love to do this though? Don't we just love to pretend like everything's okay? Don't we just love to put on that church face for everybody? I love you with the love of the Lord. Everything's good over here. It's all sunshine and rainbow, 24 hours a day, seven days a week because God loves me. You know you're lying. You're not only lying to the person you're speaking to, you're lying to God and you're lying to yourself. What does it say here? Hide not yourself from your own flesh. Your flesh is constantly at war with your spirit. Your flesh flesh does not want to pray. Your flesh does not want to meditate day and night on the scripture. Your flesh does not want to fast for all the right reasons. Your flesh does not want to study to show yourself approved. Your flesh does not want to worship and praise the Lord. Your flesh will rebel against this. It will fight against this. But do not hide yourself from your own flesh. Be honest, not just with the others about what you're dealing with, but be honest with yourself. Don't try to hide from yourself. That's not how we heal. That's not how we grow. That's not how we go from glory to glory. We have to expose what's in the dark. Secret sin cannot be, first of all, secret sin cannot be forgiven because you haven't confessed it. And if you haven't confessed it, and you're not truly repentant for it. And if you're not truly repentant for it and you aren't acknowledging that it's a problem and that you need help from the Lord, then you're not humbling yourself enough for the Holy Spirit to start doing a mighty work in you, circumcising that part of your heart that makes you act that way towards people, that makes you respond that way towards people, reply to people in that way, that makes you passive aggressive rather than confronting somebody with grace, that makes you prideful enough that you don't want to ask for help because you have always taken care of yourself and you pride yourself on that independence. It's time not to hide yourself from your own flesh. Verse 8, then shall your light break forth like the dawn. Wow, so in order for my light to break forth like the dawn, I have to expose the darkness that lives in me. Let's backtrack a little bit. Yes, I'm a Christian. Yes, I've been saved. Yes, I've been redeemed. However, there is darkness that has made its home in you that needs to be circumcised from your heart. And in order for that circumcision to take place, in order for that healing to take place, in order for you to be made new in this area in order for that crooked place to be made straight. You have to admit it's a problem. You have to expose it. Then shall your light break forth like the dawn. And next it says, and your healing shall spring up speedily. We can't heal from what we won't admit. We can't heal from what we won't acknowledge. That is why pride is such a stumbling block because pride will keep you from admitting there's an issue at all. Pride will make you think that it's everyone else's fault and that everyone else is the problem. 
But in order for our light to break forth like the dawn and our healing to spring up speedily, we have to stop hiding ourselves from our own flesh. These are not my words. This is God breathed. This is the infallible word of God. This is his advice to us. Then he says, your righteousness shall go before you. Well, our righteousness isn't even our own. It's been imputed to us. It is the righteousness of God. And it shall go before us. And the glory of the Lord shall be your rear guard. I don't know about you, but I want the glory of the Lord to follow me and be my rear guard and back me up from behind and make sure that he's kind of surveying the territory so he can alert me of any dangers being my rear guard from behind. And my righteousness that's not even mine, but was imputed to me, is the righteousness that goes before me. So he's all around. Then you shall call. And the Lord will answer. You shall cry and he will say, here I am. Why? Because the Lord loves humility. The Lord loves when you humble yourself and say, God, something that somebody just said, like it pierced me right to the heart. It hurt me a little bit. And that leads me to believe that maybe it wasn't just that they said something that hurt my feelings, but it was something in me that responded to that insult, to that criticism, whatever it was. But sometimes God is putting people in your path to tell you about you. Amen. God will put difficult people in your path, people that rub you the wrong way, people that bring you, bring you out of character and you think it's out of character, but it's really something that needs to be worked out of your heart and it's still part of you. And that's what God wants to point out to some of us today. There's things here that, that need to be worked out. And, and once they are worked out and once you expose them and once you ad admit them and once you acknowledge them and once you pull the secret sin out from the dark into the light and you expose it, then shall your light break forth like the dawn. And why do we want our light to break forth like the dawn? Because we are bearing witness to a greater light. We are bearing witness to the light of the world. And we want that light to break forth like the dawn. And we want that light to break forth like the dawn everywhere that we go so that people can wonder where that light comes from. People can be drawn to that light because there's so much darkness in their life and they're either going to flee from it or they're going to run towards it. The choice is theirs. That's the kind of light I want to break forth from me. And then our healing shall spring up speedily, expediently. The Lord shall make haste to heal you. Quickly. Amen. Then you shall call and, and the Lord will answer and you shall cry and he will say, here I am. He heard you all the other times you called and you cried. And because he didn't respond, maybe you thought he didn't, he didn't care. Maybe you thought he wasn't listening. Maybe you thought you had pushed him a little too, too far away this time and God is mad at me. And sometimes God's silence is an answer. It means that you've caused some distance somewhere. There's something there. It's not that he can't hear you. It's not that he doesn't want to respond. But there's, there's been some, some distance and sin will separate us from God. If you take away the yoke from your midst... The pointing of the finger and speaking wickedness. I'm going to say that again. If you take away the yoke from your midst. The yoke. The yoke from around your neck. The weight you carry. The shackles and chains that have you bound. If you take that away and the pointing of the finger 
I need to emphasize this. The pointing of the finger. There's a grievous evil. We don't even realize when we do it. But we point fingers at people. And we accuse them. We accuse them of things they did not do. We accuse them of things they did not say because we're looking through the lenses of our own trauma. They said something that hurt, but you didn't realize that you really have a spirit of offense. They said something, but all you heard was criticism because you're seeing through the lenses of your own trauma. Instead of asking God, Lord, I didn't like what they said. Lord, that didn't feel too good. Lord, I really want to say something back. But at the same time, did they say something true? Was there some truth in that statement? Is there an area where I need to grow? Are you using them? To open my eyes to something I wasn't aware of? Do you ever ask those questions? We need to stop pointing the finger because pointing the finger makes us feel better about us while taking us away from what we should be doing. Because where that's where the growth happens. That's where the glory happens. That's where the greatest moves of God happen. Not when we're pointing the finger, but when we are looking inward at ourselves. When we are in a place of isolation and introspection. That's where the growth is. You can't grow if you're always focused on where everybody else falls short. You can't go from glory to glory if you're always looking down on your brother or your sister because they're not in their walk where you think they should be or they are not progressing at the rate that you think they should be progressing or they are not experiencing the same moves of God that you are. But they're only ready for milk and you're on meat. You're on solid food. So what you're expecting, you couldn't even respect from you couldn't even expect from yourself in the beginning of your walk. The pointing of the finger and speaking wickedness. Speaking wickedness. You can choose to speak life or death. The choice is yours. But we will be held accountable for the idle words that we are speaking to other individuals. And so we are to guard our mouths. So that bitterness and sweet is not coming out of the same place. Because it's not what goes into our mouth that defiles us. It's what comes out of it. If you pour yourself out for the hungry and satisfy the desire of the afflicted, then shall your light rise in the darkness. This is just telling you to have the heart of a servant. To look for different... Give me the word, Holy Spirit. Look for different circumstances where you can be a light to someone else who is in a very dark place. Look for areas where you can serve throughout the day. You can serve many different ways. But looking for an opportunity, not just to help out another individual, but to share, share the love of Christ with them, to spread the gospel, to minister, to testify to the goodness and the mercy and the favor and the grace of God. Then shall your light rise in the darkness and your gloom be as the noon day. You know that serving someone else is the best thing that you can do when you're depressed and feeling low. Look for someone to bless. Look for someone to help. I don't care what it is. 
That is the best way to get the focus off of you. And then your gloom will be as the noonday. Why? Because there's just something that happens on the inside of us when we're doing what we were meant to do, which is to serve, not to be served. And the Lord will guide you continually. He will guide you continually. Why? Because the, the steps of the righteous are ordered, number one. Number two, he is a lamp to our feet and a light to our path. And he is also a mighty counselor. So he will guide us continually as long as we let him lead. Because sometimes we like to lead our own lives. And we lead our own lives down all the wrong paths. Because God's ways are not our ways. And his thoughts are not our thoughts. His ways and his thoughts will always be higher than ours. And we get ourselves in trouble when we try to guide ourselves. So the Lord will guide you continually and satisfy your desire in scorched places, dry places, wilderness seasons, barren wastelands. He will be your rivers of living water in those dry, scorched places and make your bones strong. You shall be like a watered garden, like a spring of water who wa whose waters do not fail. He said, drink of me and you will never thirst again. Drink of this water and you will never thirst again. So you shall be like a well-watered garden. And when you think of a well-watered garden, what do we think about? We think about things that flourish and are vibrant and green and alive and thrive. Well, that's how I want to be. I don't want to wither away and die. I don't want my leaves to turn brown. I don't want to be walking around lifeless. I want to be like a well-watered garden. And he is living water himself. Whose waters do not fail. Verse 12. And your ancient ruin shall be rebuilt. And you shall raise up the foundations of many generations, your ancient ruins. A lot of times by the time the Lord pulls us out of darkness into his marvelous light, light, our life is the equivalent of ancient ruins, rubble and ash, pieces of what it used to be, an empire crushed to dust. But that's exactly where his power is made perfect, is in our weakness. And a lot of times that's where he finds us, is at our weakest, lowest, most vulnerable place. But it says here, he promises, and your ancient ruins shall be rebuilt. He's going to rebuild you from the ground up. So even if your life is in pieces now, fear not, be not discouraged. Because Jesus, even during his ministry on the earth, he was a carpenter. But the Lord loves to rebuild things that have been decimated. The Lord loves to make whole things that are lying in pieces on the floor. And he says, after those ancient ruins shall be rebuilt, then you shall raise up the foundations of many generations. Wait a minute. So not only are you going to take the ruins of my life, Lord, not only are you going to take the broken pieces of myself, the fragmented pieces of myself, the shattered pieces of myself and, and, and mold and shape them and rebuild them from the ground up on a solid foundation this time, not one that, that was shaky before and unstable, but the kind of foundation that when a wind beats up against this, this new house, this new empire that you have built, it will not fall. So after you rebuild my ruins from the ground up, then I shall raise up the foundations of many generations. Yes, by the power of his spirit. The next verse, you shall be called the repairer of the breach. So not only did the Lord repair you, but now he's going to 
put you in the position to be able to be a conduit for the repair of others. The repair of others. The repair of broken and damaged relationships, marriages and families. The repairer of the breach. The restorer of streets to dwell in. If you turn back your foot from the Sabbath by doing your pleasure on my holy day and cause call the Sabbath a delight in the holy day of the Lord honorable, if you honor it, not going your own ways or seeking your own pleasure or talking idly, then you shall take delight in the Lord. So we're not to go our own way. We're not to make our own path. We're not to create our own plan. We're not to draft up our own blueprint. We're to seek his pleasure. We're to seek the Lord's desire for our life. We're to seek his will. Not going your own way. No matter what that means. We're to make that sacrifice for the Lord. Amen. Or talking idly. Again, I cannot stress this enough. There are some times when I really want to answer someone back and the Lord stops me. And the reason why the Lord stops me is because the consequences and the judgment pronounced on them for the idle words spoken will only be compounded by how many times they answer back. So if I keep the conversation going, it's just compounding a judgment. It's compounding all the things they're going to have to answer to God for. And I don't want to take part in that. I don't want to take part in that. So sometimes no response is the best response. Then you shall take delight in the Lord. And I will make you ride on the heights of the earth. He takes us right out of the lowest place. Right out of the lowest place. Right out of, right out of the valley. And puts us on the height of the earth. The mountain tops. The Lord, when he calls us out, he raises us up in such a way because God does nothing small and it's all to give him glory. And he does it in front of all, he does it in front of all the people who said you would never be. And he does it in front of all the people that said that you never could. And he does it in front of all the people that said you weren't hearing from God. And he does it in front of all the people who doubted his plan for your life. Who thought that maybe you were going a little crazy. I will feed you with the heritage of Jacob, your father. For the mouth of the Lord has spoken. And when the mouth of the Lord speaks, understand me. All his promises are yes and amen. All his promises prove true. His word does not come back to him void. It never will. It's going to accomplish everything that he sets forth for it to do. The mouth of the Lord has spoken. That settles it. The command has already gone out. And that's what you need to believe the next time that you say a prayer. Now keep in mind that when you pray, you want it to be in accordance with with what God wants, not what you want. But when it's in accordance with his will, that command has already gone out. So whether you see it in the natural or not, it's already behind the scenes in the spirit realm. It's already working itself out. God has already gone before you in your situation. And he's waiting for you when you get there to say, Oh, ye of little faith, why did you doubt? Because he can do exceedingly abundantly above all we can ask or think. 
and he expects us to walk by faith. He expects us to walk by faith and not by sight. Meaning we said we have to stop focusing so much on what we can see in the natural, what looks log logical and plausible and possible and all of that. And stop putting God in, in, in limitations on the Lord and, and, and stop putting him in this little box and saying God would never do it this way or that. How do you know? How do you know? His understanding is unsearchable. No matter how much we study him, we, we could never fully comprehend his ways. So how do you know whether or not God would say it that way, whether or not God would do it that way? And don't focus so much on the outcome that you want to see because God might have another way to bring it to pass. And it might not be at all how you envisioned it. You might, you're still going to get to where you're supposed to go, but you might not go the, the route that you were anticipating. So just trust him, just lean on him. Because he's, he's working mighty miracles all the time. And he's going to take those ruins. And he's going to make something amazing out of them. But we have to get honest with ourselves. We have to come to him humbled. With that contrite heart. Repentant. Exposed. Naked before him and say, Lord, this is all of me. And I know that there's these issues and I know I have these problems and I know these things need to be worked out of me because they can't go where you want to take me. And I won't be as effective if you don't pluck this stuff out of my heart. And it will only be a hindrance to me and to the people that I'm trying to reach by the power of your spirit. So get it out of me, Lord. Purge it out of me, Lord. Seek and search my heart. Know it every day. Point out any wicked way in me and lead me to the way everlasting. Hallelujah. I hope this touched somebody today. I hope this blessed somebody today. I hope it really spoke to you. And I just, I just pray that you will see God's goodness, God's mercy, God's, God's grace, God's, God's favor, God's kindness throughout the rest of your weekend. I love you all. God bless.